Welcome to the Time for Success podcast. I'm your host, Matt Barbie, and this is the show where we dig into what does it take to create the kind of business that gives you the, the life that you dreamed of so that you can do more things with the people that you love and you have the money to, to be able to pay for doing those things that you love to do with the people that you love. And uh, there's, there's some key principles behind that. And you know, you have to, one of those things is that you, you have to have the right people in place and you have to really be able to, to engage them and equip them, empower them. And that's why I have our guest this week on with us, Judy Ryan of LifeWork Systems. Hey, Judy, how you doing? Hey, Matt. I'm real happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. We, we, we wouldn't have it any other way. We uh, have a special treat in store because one of the things that I think is going on right now is a, a lot of people are un, unhappy. There's not you know, good diversity and inclusion, uh, I think, uh, in, in many communities and many organizations or people are trying to do the systematic change, but they don't really know how. They're trying to get people to, to feel, I mean, just, just more, more cared for, more cared about, I think, in general, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's these yeah. power differentials that are just rampant right now, and, and people are saying it's, it's time for a change. Right. Yeah, that's the good news is people really are tired of what's going on and they want a change and they're really smart enough to know that they need a systems change, which is yeah. really excellent. The problem yeah. is I don't hear a lot of people really understanding what kind of system change needs to occur. And I understand why that's happening, because there's really not a lot of system developers out there. So mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though we can recognize when something is broken, we may not know at what you know, at what degree at which to fix what's broken. So right. I'm excited, though, that people are really ready to drop some of the systems that are causing so many problems and so many um, inequities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely time. And I, I, I'm really excited to really dig into that, into this, uh, into this podcast. So well, let, let the audience know a little bit more about your background and what LifeWork Systems is about before we dig into all that, just so they kind of know where, where you're coming from, where, where, from, from whence you hearken. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try not to get too analytical about it, but all I'm right. all right. much of a nerd, so I might, but you'll have to all pull right. me all in, right. brain me in. Um, but I actually, <laughs> just for the common folk, Judy, just, <laughs> just like me, common folk. Common folk. <laughs> so I actually kind of fell in love with a psychology model Mm -hmm. several decades ago. And, and that's mm -hmm. what we use right now. It's based on the work of Alfred Adler. And I've always been excited about it. I've always felt it, it was ahead of its time. And so mm -hmm. I started to work with that model, work with it with regards to the public, work with it with regards to education and government and corporate mm -hmm. and all kinds of different industries. And um, I knew how powerful it was early on and continue to know how powerful it is. So I uh, formed a company in 2002 called LifeWork Systems, and I'm the mm -hmm. CEO of that company. And our mission is to create a world in which all people love their lives. So when you mm -hmm. opened this podcast about being with the people you love and making the money you love and having the life you love, I mean, it's right. very aligned because, you know, even as a business owner, sometimes business owners might think, well, why do I care if my people love their life or not? I just care right. about our business, right. you know? Yeah. Well, when people love their lives, they're extraordinary in the way that they produce and create and yeah. innovate and solve. I mean, it's really hand in hand with profitability and performance, you know, Absolutely. to uh, love your life and help each other to do that. And so, um, so what I love about what I do is that I can see it relieves a lot of suffering. And right now we yeah. certainly have a lot of suffer suffering. So Absolutely. Um, my biggest challenge at this time in our history is where do we enter the fray because there's so much going on. Uh, but I absolutely feel like I have some system information that could really be helpful at this time for even just the general community. So. Mm -hmm. Well, great, great. Thanks for sharing that. I think uh, you hit on some really, really big uh, pain points there. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's time that we dig in. So I know Adlerian, Ad Adlerian psychology. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about that. Like what, what is that? What does that mean? Is was this something yeah. to do with like power or something? Yes, like that? It, has, it definitely has to do with power, but more mm -hmm. importantly, it has to do with what conditions cause us to either have um, like an activated inferiority 
complex, mm-hmm. which is, mm-hmm. we've heard that term, but most people don't know that Alfred Adler actually coined that phrase. Yeah. Um, so what it means is, and Brene Brown talks about that today. She talks about it in mm. terms of shame, you know, and how mm. um, our country needs to get a handle on what's causing so much shame. And yeah. even Brene Brown, who's very popular and, and worldwide, gets asked to speak, but people will qualify her and say, you know, but don't talk about any of that shame stuff because it's a little dark. It's a little, right, <laughs> it right. makes us all a little uncomfortable, right? And um, her statement is the same as my statement. Until we deal with that, we can't really move forward as a community. Yeah. So, um, Adler was all about how do you create conditions and conversations where people go the opposite direction of inferiority? Because when we go into inferiority feelings, we actually start to set ourselves up for Mm. uninterrupted struggles. And Mm. those struggles can be turned inward, like depression and anxiety and obesity and addiction and all of those kinds of struggles. But they can also be the ones that we see everywhere right now. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. right, you're wrong. Um, I win, you lose. The corruption, all of the isms come from inferiority complex. It's just, to me, it's so like clear and obvious, but to many people, they get really caught up in the surface Like I was mentioning to you, Matt, that a friend of mine who has done some training for me and was a Mm -hmm. former mayor Mm -hmm. said to me, you need to get in there and fix the police departments. And while they're kind of a part of the symptoms showing up, there's there's deeper roots that involve a lot more that has to do with us as a larger community. And so when if I were to go in and help right now with with what's going on around race, for example, and um, abuse of power. I would be taking a whole subset of stakeholders within a community because what's occurring is a group dynamic and it needs to change as a group dynamic. Mm. So, uh, so Adler was really about putting those conditions in place where people will feel a healthy sense of belonging and significance with each other on a regular basis. And that's the only real remedy mm-hmm. to um, being, um, you know, where we're creative instead of destructive with each other. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that that's interesting, but you know, I, I think for a lot of folks, sometimes I can kind of feel like this, this mushy gushy type mm-hmm. stuff, like, okay, this is all mm-hmm. a bunch of like psycho babble. Yeah. Let's all go sing Kumbaya. Right. Right. Yeah. Where's the <laughs> fire? Where's the circle? Let's hold hands. Yeah. So how does this really play out? First of all, the, the, the infor- inferiority complexes, how, how does that even happen? in society, in a community? Well, this is probably, for some people, the most unpopular thing they want to hear. But I believe it actually, those systems that cause inferiority complex are, uh, they begin in childhood, and they also Mm -hmm. propagate as we go into adulthood. And by that, I mean the control models that we use to raise good citizens from children to adulthood. And those uh, are control models like using threats and power over dynamics with people, Mm -hmm. do it or else, do it or else you'll get written up, do it or else you'll get Mm -hmm. spanked, whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. it's playing out in all kinds of places right now. Uh, Even within, uh, when families are kept home right now because of the pandemic, there's all of this, um, you know, abuse going on in homes. It's all increasing right now. So that use, that misuse of power starts in our families. It's showing up in our schools. It's not only in using autocratic power over dynamics, but it's also in using incentives and rewards, which do not sound very like a wrong thing. Right, right. right. um, And it's also in the judgments that we bestow on one another that seem Mm -hmm. sort of benign, like, oh, I'm so proud of you or go make me proud. Or the ones that are like, man, I'm so disappointed in you. Yeah. Um, those are, and then there's a fourth control that most people don't recognize either. And it's when we pamper and spoil people. And, and I don't mean, um, when we're in a workplace and we give somebody, a you know, ping pong table, I'm not talking about that. Right. I'm talking about any time where we're doing for someone what they're capable of doing for themselves. And we're, you know, we're helicopter hovering and we're telling them how to do it. And, and we're overcompensating for them as if we have no faith in them. And that creates a real serious weakness in people. I was just recently with a client who had about 25 employees and I showed them these four control models. And I said, which one is your boss mostly using? And they all said pampering and spoiling. He constantly nags and reminds and uh, tells us everything over and over again, you know, and that's actually very, uh, very 
neglectful of their of their yeah. empowerment. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so is that like micromanagement is what you're talking about there? Kind it's of? Micro, micromanagement. It's also enablement. It's overcompensating. Mm. I mean, mm. a really bad case of this is the parents of this, you know, the celebrity parents that paid for their kids uh, to, to get their scores changed to get into Ivy League oh, schools. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. definitely enabling. And, yeah. and you really think those kids are going to turn out ethical and highly responsible no, when that happens. No. Yeah. I mean, it just sends all kinds of crazy signals, not only to everyone, but to those students, those children. So mm-hmm. that's going on more than we know. And so mm-hmm. uh, probably the only one we think of as a real control model is the autocratic. But these mm-hmm. other three, which look more sublime, those are really powerfully harmful as well. Yeah. So uh, most people are like, well, if you don't have those, you're really suggesting something permissive and wishy-washy and kumbayage, and we're not. Okay, we're so it is, so what is it? We're like, what, what's, what, what, are we, what are we proposing to take its place? Well, first of all, when we do the control models, we're always holding negative beliefs about people, limiting negative beliefs. When we're using autocratic behavior or practices, Mm -hmm. we're holding them as though I can't really trust you. You need to be policed, which is probably Mm -hmm. driving some leaders crazy right now when the people are working from home. Right. That style. Right. Um, Then there's when you're giving incentives and reward and dangling carrots, your Mm -hmm. real belief about people are you're kind of selfish and lazy unless I'm the one that takes responsibility for your motivation. Okay. When we're doing judgment, we're saying, I know best, you're inferior to me, and I'm going to bestow these judgments from above. So I've already got you in a downward position, you know, as far as hierarchy. And then when we're pampering and spoiling, we're really holding a belief about people like, you really can't without me. Yeah. So, um, so a responsibility-based model is the replacement. And in that model, you always hold on to the certainty that people are great or they desperately want to be great. And mm-hmm. if they're not acting great, it's because the conditions that they've been immersed in are triggering that inferiority complex and need to be um, replaced, which is okay. very, very powerful in itself. So yeah. uh, the fact that we have 71% disengagement, even before we had all these recent problems, tells me that the control models have already been suppressing engagement. Well, well uh, let's let's circle back to this. So, seventy-one percent disengagement. What do you mean by that? According to the Gallup organization, every mm-hmm. year they come out with how many people in the United States workforce are mm-hmm. fully engaged, which means they come with their A game and they give mm-hmm. full effort and they're always, you know, contributing as much as they can, like you and me, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. A game. Um, yes, Absolutely. A game. And right they're, uh, they're about 29% of the population. But the yeah. other 71% has over 50% who are called disengaged. And they're, mm. not, they're not terribly disengaged, but they're disengaged like a student who does C minus work. Yeah. I'm going to do what I can to not get fired, and I'm going to be semi-reliable, but don't ask me to go above and beyond because you're not going to get that from me. And right, so right. we kind of get a resentful compliance from the C-minus people. Like on Monday, they're the ones going, oh, man, it's Monday. I got to go to work. You know, they're not going, oh, my God, I can't get, wait to get to work. I've got this new idea. Um, and wait, so wait a second. That's like everybody – that's like everybody on Facebook, though. Like, know, you know, there's always a. <laughs> it's at least 55%. So, yeah, you're going to oh, hear from yeah. them. Yeah. You're going to yeah. hear from them. And then there's the real troublemakers. They're the ones that uh, comprise about 16%. Hmm. And they are um, called actively disengaged. So, they're the ones mm-hmm. that might come to work late all the time, or they're, they're, they come drunk or high, or they come um, yeah. and they. And they text on their phone all day or they're constantly gossiping they're constantly sabotaging Mm -hmm. and they're actually found to cost about sixteen thousand dollars per person so every 100 people that a company has if that number is is in place if they really have that much disengage active disengagement it costs over two hundred fifty thousand for every 100 people Wow, and then wow. Um, and then the people that are doing the C minus work, they're not really costing the company, but they're not gaining uh, what the twenty nine percent gain. The fully engaged people, on average, bring in about thirty two thousand dollars of additional revenue for, mm-hmm. for the companies. So if uh, if you have a workplace that's either commonplace, typical, or even worse, a lot of those fully engaged people are at risk to leave because yeah. they don't want to be around that energy. You know? Yeah. 
and that's yeah. over over nine hundred thousand dollars that they're bringing in. So yeah. between the ones that are costing you and the ones that are you know saving you, you could be in a world of trouble if you don't clean that up. Absolutely. Yeah, the the way that I've kind of explained it to people in the past is that uh, if you imagine all your people uh, condensed into a boat. Uh, you know, there's like 10 people in the boat. You've got uh, two or three people who might actually actively be rowing the boat. You've got like maybe four or five people who are just kind of sitting there watching the sights. Some people are kind of being encouraging of the people who are rowing. <laughs> Some people are kind of heckling them. Oh, come on, man. Like you're working yeah. too hard. Right. Relax, you know, <laughs> live life, YOLO. And then you've got uh, like a couple people in the back who are who are actively trying to sink your boat sink your yes. ship they're, they're like punching holes in it they're like trying to toss other people off the side you know yes saying, you know this is a terrible mutiny mutiny so <laughs> that is, I, you know i remember you telling me that once before and i wish i could hold that in my memory because it's <laughs> such a good image yeah yeah i mean even the ones that are sitting there not rowing that's so right. aggravating when you're the one rowing yeah. And yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when, when you're an actively engaged person and, and you're really working hard and you're innovating and it, to see people who are just kind of mailing it in, I mean, you know, I, I tell people there's a difference between people who are working on mission with you versus working in your mission. You know, they right. just happen to be in there kind of doing enough to not get in trouble, yes. making sure they get that paycheck, you, you know, Unfortunately, I talk with a lot of small business owners who still have that old model where they should just they should just do their job and they'll get a paycheck. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, they they probably will, but that's the thing. You're you're missing out on. I believe the figures are somewhere between like twenty and forty percent of of potential productivity if mm -hmm. they're just doing enough to get their paycheck. Well, and you know what, as much as that's exciting to a business owner, what I think is even more exciting is to yeah. see fully in, you know, charged up in a live team yeah. of people that get along, which is not very common. So when you see yeah. it, it's kind of shocking. Um, uh, I think I mentioned recently, I have a client that's working on uh, on the fly solutions for COVID because they're in IT mm -hmm. healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing about how they're just kicking it over and over again, because they have um, they paid their dues to know how to get along and how to communicate, how to work through challenges and how to have really high trust and how to jump in yeah. and lead or follow as they need to. And once you have that, you never want to go back from that. I, oh, I think yeah. most people just need to see more of that. Mm -hmm. So they go, mm -hmm. I want what they have. Like Sally, <laughs> Harry met Sally's. <laughs> right, right. I'll, I'll have what he's drinking. Right. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's not too hard to, uh, to drink the Kool-Aid whenever, you know, you guys are having fun, right? You know, so yes. unfortunately, kind of going back to where we see this, uh, I think in, in our communities, because I mean, it is, it is a, uh, a very timely subject. And, and I think that it's worth talking about. I mean, first of all, I think we can both agree. I mean, we'll, we'll, I think it's, it's fair putting it out there that black lives, of course, matter. Absolutely. Um, and, and at the same time, we, we believe that there's, there's great cops, there's great leaderships that are out there who, who really do care. Yes. And then there's those people who are kind of in the middle, um, who, who they, they kind of care, but they're, I mean, they're probably disengaged uh, on, on, on both sides. And then there's people who are adamantly opposed to either side as well. And, and again, trying to sink the ship of, of whichever movement you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that kind of goes back to what you're saying in terms of, you know, these, there's these, these senses of like power differentials and, and, um, and, and unfortunately it seems that, that maybe there are people who are in positions of power that, um, they try to enforce that power a little too much. Well, here's the thing. We're all taught power over and power mm. under. And both of those mm -hmm. are harmful belief systems. Yeah. So, um, so, and also when you were just saying, you know, you got this group and you got this group and then these people are right. kind of standing back. One of the reasons that's happening, that kind of um, operating in silos in a way. And that's yeah. the reason I, I wouldn't want to just come and work strictly on one group. Because mm -hmm. um, when you do that, what you're usually doing is, is there's some level of finger pointing. It doesn't mean that there's mm -hmm. not real guilt happening or real crime happening or real misbehavior happening. It's just that when you um, start to change a whole community's way of operating, 
then it's really more about what system, if it was put in place, would fix these problems, not mm -hmm. who's to blame and why is this happening. That's mm -hmm. really a distraction for us. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we know it's real and we know some reasons why it's happening, but it's more helpful to go, what, how would we change the system so this wouldn't continue? Yeah. You know, I, I see a lot of people get very, very stuck in the way they think it has to be like right now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, and I've, I've found when I've worked with people who are kind of diametrically opposed, mm -hmm. who, who are kind of on either sides of the fence, we make best progress when we can kind of first figure out what, what the commonalities are, what that common vision is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and once we get that kind of common vision of like, we're, we're really, where are we trying to go? What, what do we really ultimately want in, mm -hmm. in, in that community or organization? Once we see that that a lot of those are are pretty similar, we can kind of work backwards from there. Okay, so how, what what other things can we agree on and start there to kind of start the healing process, and instead of of just where it, it ends up stopping and and why we think we're all different and and, yeah. and all that. And I actually think that's what Adler does so well. He helps yeah. us understand what causes a human being to function highly mm -hmm. or not function highly. And then how do you train a whole group of people to understand those mindsets and those practices all at the same time? So, Matt, like when we work in a company and we work uh, with a group of people, it's never just the senior leaders that we work with. Only. Right. It's right. always the CEO to the frontline staff. Mm -hmm. It's always in, when, in our work in school reform, it was always... Yeah. Parents, teachers, administrators, and students, and a community board or a community team from the yeah. neighborhood. And then what was so what's powerful about that is everybody's um, choosing a different system than the mm -hmm. existing control systems. Everybody's understanding common language, common tools, common ways of creating um, empowered, lovable, connected experiences for each other, and that okay. becomes this amazing experience like I'll, I'll just tell you one quick story on that in the school reform projects we were working in the most at risk most discouraged neighborhoods to help more high school kids stay in school and graduate because in the city okay. of St. Louis the schools were really dropping like flies the high school students you know yeah and they wanted to improve that situation so we worked with the, all of those stakeholders within that yeah. in the schools and I remember going to a family meeting where mm. one of the, the students' parent was a single parent mom, was going mm. to our parent training. The student was learning the skills and language and tools in the classroom. The teachers were learning those same skills. And I okay. went and sat in on one of their family meetings, which I also huh. could go in and sit on their classroom meetings, you know, which yeah. is really fun. And this particular student was kind of a really cool guy in school. And see, he's, he always acted a little too cool for our stuff, you know? Right, right. Um, so his, his instructor was a little worried about him. But I said, well, I'm going to go see what he does when he's at home, you know? And I went mm -hmm. and sat in on a family meeting. And he was so incredibly getting what we were teaching. Because at one oh, point... Wow. They, were, uh, they were talking about some things in the family. And he said, you know what? You're gossiping about her, and he's gossiping about me to you. Why don't we put a mind trust in place? We need to do that, which is a tool to stop gossip. And okay. so, and then a little later, he goes, you know what? I think we really need to do some healthy venting here. So he knew that tool. And then later, yeah. he knew a tool called appreciative inquiry, where he says, oh, this would be a great place for this appreciative inquiry question. Mm -hmm. So when it was done, I, I said to his instructor, I called her up and I said, you don't have to worry about him. He may be acting too cool for this, but he's getting it. And not only does he understand it, he knows when and how to apply <laughs> it. And I know that will carry forward for him in, yeah. you know, in his future and his everything. So... Um, that's where I think real systemic change happens because hmm. you get to the entire root of the problem. Right. Right. Interesting. So I think, I think we need to try to make this uh, a little bit more concrete for folks, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. again, it, this is, this is, does directly affect profitability. A lot of people mm -hmm. think in an organization. So if you're a business owner, this, this affects your pro your profitability, people mm -hmm. not being able to communicate, people getting stuck in, I mean, even defensiveness is, mm -hmm. is a result of these power differentials. Somebody, mm -hmm. somebody kind of feels that, that somebody's gaining power over them or, or they feel like their, their power is threatened. 
And so mm -hmm. even if there's like a snarky defensive type comment, uh, it really is rooted in some of these issues. Um, Absolutely. And then it starts to take on its own life. You know, yeah. so when we don't know how to avoid it, eliminate it, uh, work in such a way that we don't even start it, um, it just starts to morph. And I think that's why over time people just get more and more discouraged and leave, even if they right. only leave emotionally. Right. So let's say, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a business owner. Maybe we can kind of mm -hmm. create some sort of example here. So let's say I'm a business owner and, um, you know, I see two of my employees uh, are, are kind of arguing one is, uh, is, is maybe, uh, let's say a manager and they're kind of really on top of the employee. They're, they're just really making snarky comments. Come on. Like you can't do better than that. You can do better than that. I know you can do better than that. Like, what's wrong with you? Like what, what do I do as a business owner to, to try to turn a situation like that around? Well, what's interesting about that example is I remember I was, you know, we are often brought in when people are having problems. So this mm -hmm. happened to be a company where the CIO was a brand new CIO, it was a woman, and she had two mid-level managers that were at each other. They mm -hmm. were in a, 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 just a kind of a disgruntled way with each other. And mm -hmm. what happened is their team started aligning against each other as well. So she was kind of freaked out because she thought I could lose my job if I don't get this mm. worked out because it's really mushrooming out. And yeah. so she, um, she brought us in, she brought me in to work with them. And I just applied our tools right away with them. And um, literally within one session, I think, they had a clear idea about what was really going on and how they had misconstrued certain things and how to have okay. a really fruitful uh, conversation and next steps. And um, so then they had us come back and do their retreat. And we did a lot of very interactive things around problems that were going on in that whole mm -hmm. set of community. It was about 60 people. And, and then they said, oh my gosh, what else have you got? But the important point of this is that those two managers about a year later uh, the one manager told me I would take a bullet for him now. Like he's one of my oh, wow. best friends. So it, it's just one of those things that it, they couldn't get out of their own way. They didn't mm -hmm. have common understanding. They didn't have common tools. They didn't know what facets of trust had been broken. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to repair them. And now I have video clips of some of them saying, oh my gosh, now that I understand how to identify where the trust got broken, in any relationship, I don't have to just say, oh, I just will never get along with that person because I know how to right. fix just about every relationship I have. Okay. So you, you've mentioned a mind trust. You talked about the trust being broken. How does trust come into play in, in repairing the, the, the power dynamics and, and the, the hurt that it causes and the problems that it causes? Cause. Well, part of, part of it is just first and foremost, making trustworthiness the most important priority in a responsibility-based culture. So when we okay. build a new model, if you picture a house and the foundation mm -hmm. is the most important part of that house, mm -hmm. it's trustworthiness. So Matt, okay. if you and I had, let's say we had something unresolved between us, okay. I, would be, I would be looking at, gosh, here are the eight behaviors that build trust between me and Matt. If I'm not feeling like we're at a 10 with each other, it uh, doesn't mean we even have to be best friends, although I know you really like being best friends with me. But oh, you know, yeah, you, besties. sometimes, sometimes <laughs> a, 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 having a 10 with a coworker doesn't mean you're best friends. It just means you right. don't have any unresolved issues. Because I think people confuse that, like you think you have to be best friends with everybody. No. Mm -hmm. So let's say we, if we had an issue, I'd be looking at these eight behaviors. And they're um, behaviors like honesty and straightforwardness and respect mm -hmm. and recognition and disclosure and seeking excellence and following through on commitments and, you know, and all of those kinds of behaviors, I would be going, where am I letting Matt down on those? And where is mm -hmm. he letting me down? So maybe I'm uh, treating you as though you're sort of um, less worthy than you actually are. And I, maybe I'm not respecting you. Maybe I'm aggravated. So I've stopped respecting you. And I okay. see that. And maybe I go, oh, you know what? Matt probably doesn't even know we're not at a 10 because I haven't even revealed anything to him. So I'm not being very disclosing. So maybe I see those two things. Yeah. But then I realize, gosh, when I look at Matt with regard to these eight things, what I'm really upset with him about is he promised he would do X, Y, and Z. And he didn't follow through on that commitment. And so once I've identified those broken parts, I can say, I'm just going to take one to start with, and I'm going to use some of our tools and go and do a repair job on that one, one okay. at a time. And maybe it moves us from a seven to an eight. 
And then it's, okay. us, you know, and, and, and as soon as I've engaged you in that process, you might be working just as hard as I am to restore those things because mm -hmm. we already even have a common priority to make trust between us super important and right. we have the means right. to getting there. So yeah. half the time, it's just, we don't even know what's broken. We have no idea how to talk about it. We're afraid it's going to blow up in our face mm -hmm. or that we're going to end up fired or that, you know, it, or that it's going to somehow get real embarrassing. Yeah. And all of that keeps us from even knowing how to deal with it. Yeah. Okay. So, so what does this look like? Let's say, you know, you and me are at it and I'm, I'm very, very upset. And mm -hmm. my natural reaction is to, to say, you know what, Judy, uh, you need to quit picking up or you need, you need to quit slacking. Okay. You know, I do all the work around here and I'm tired of you slacking. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just start mm -hmm. doing your job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause, mm -hmm. cause it's not fair to the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. What is maybe a better way? <laughs> well, to go first about of that? all, hopefully <laughs> after you've gone through the training, you'd be going, Oh my gosh, I'm using that control model of uh, best bestowing my criticism and disapproval. Right? Okay. Like in some okay. essence, you're saying I'm I'm disappointed in you. Shape up. Saying right? I'm I'm better than you. Yeah, I know best, and you're acting like on. an idiot. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you would you would have some awareness. There would also be ground rules because the likelihood is high that when you're aggravated with somebody, you're going to go and talk to a coworker. Oh my God, that yeah. Judy Ryan, she's doing okay. X, Y, and Z. You know. So what happens yeah. in these organizations is we don't have understanding and we don't even have ground rules. Yeah. Like I remember one time this one guy said, oh, all you have to do to have a good culture is be transparent. I go, are you kidding me? You could be, you could cause a bloodbath being transparent if you don't have <laughs> any guidelines, you know? And I actually wrote an article called when, when transparency becomes a bloodbath, because <laughs> the reality is you have to have some ground rules mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. everybody has come to understand and learn. And it's almost even okay if people are messing up right and left, as long as they're willing to get on track with learning how to do it differently, mm -hmm. you know, then they start to over time go, Oh my gosh, I can see how much it hurts that I come at somebody with this control method or this control method. And yeah. um, more, we're more willing to go, okay, even if I don't can't think of what to do, I'm going to go talk to my mentor because everybody has yeah. a mentor. Okay. So if, uh, so if, if I'm in that situation and, and I'm better equipped, so I think we talk about tools, we don't always really think about tools as the, the words that we use or even our, the way that we use those words, um, how we, we use inflection and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But when we, but those are tools just the same. So I think for somebody to, to kind of wrap their head around when, when you're talking about these tools, it's kind of like the difference between uh, saying, you know, I, I, I hate you, you suck at your job versus, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've kind of noticed uh, that um, some of these things weren't getting done at the end of the day. And I'm just wondering, you know, how, how can I help you? Like, what, what are some of the obstacles? Maybe there's, maybe we can brainstorm together and figure out. Well, and, it, and it could be that you actually offer support rather than criticism, but sometimes right. it's actually just asking for what you want. Okay. So, or expressing a frustration in a way where you are not intending to hurt somebody and you use a method so that you won't. Okay, so give, give me an example. And this is a kind of funny story. Yeah. So there's a tool called the frustration tool. It's just one of mm. them. And by the mm. way, that's, I just that's want probably to what everybody to, needs. Like everybody needs the frustration tool right now. <laughs> 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say that sometimes concepts themselves are tools. Like we have this one yeah. uh, concept around uh, listening for language that's what's called other directed mm -hmm. versus language that's truly accountable. So if I say, uh, Matt, will you go and do X, Y, and Z? And you say, well, I'll try. I would say, Matt, that's not the language of self-directed. That's the language of, you know, no commitment. Right. right. So, I, I, I would say that Yoda says. Exactly. <laughs> Do or do not. <laughs> right, right, right. So there is no try. So, yeah. So, well, yeah. there's a whole lot of things around those things. But just, th <laughs> just that awareness can go, you know what? That feels like you're coming from this place where there's some kind of barrier or small thought going on. Mm. What do you think? You know, and you have awareness around even as the concept becomes a tool. But the frustration tool, mm. um, let's say you were my brother in my household when I was, a, you know, a little kid. Because my kids right. knew these tools. Brother from and, another mother. I get and it. And let's yeah. say you always leave the toilet paper roll empty, right? Okay, when that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the frustration tool has three parts. The first part is, I don't like it when, and you state the behavior. You don't say, I don't mm -hmm. like it when you're a selfish jerk because you leave the toilet paper roll empty. You say, I don't like it when 
you leave the toilet paper roll empty. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the most important step. And it's, it's the, the deeper desire that I have okay. because I want us to be a family that has each other's back. I mm. want to feel like we're watching out for each other. And I also want to feel really confident that I'm not going to be trapped in the bathroom without what I need. So I'm mm -hmm. being very open about my desires for myself mm. and you and I. And then mm -hmm. I'll say, so Matt, what I want from you, and I'm very, it's using the words, what I want is mm. I want you to replace the toilet paper whenever it's the last piece. Are you willing? So you, and you not only state the behavior you want, you ask for the commitment. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, a secretary, I may have told you this story. She was a very timid person. One of these people that really loves harmony, relationships are everything to her, you know, pr high priority to be fair and yeah. inspirational and everything. She was kind of terrified when there was a frustration. But mm. when she learned this tool, she said, you know, I think this would really help me because I wouldn't be so worried I was going to wreck somebody's day or hurt somebody or end up it blowing up in my face. But she had a senior manager, an executive actually, mm -hmm. who she worked for part time and he was not involved in our project. Mm -hmm. And um, he would make meetings with her and then he would cancel them without telling her. And he did this pretty regularly. He was kind of a managed by intimidation sort of person. So he, he would do those things almost like it was his privilege to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And so she went and practiced the tool. Hey, I don't like it when you uh, cancel meetings and you don't let me know because I want lots of mutual respect and really strong teamwork with you. And I want to feel peaceful about knowing where I'm going when we're supposed to have a connect, you know, get together or whatever. So what I want is for you to text me, email me, or call me when you change a schedule between us, are you willing? So that's what she did. She practiced it and she went and did it. And this is his response. <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? I pay your <laughs> paycheck, lady. You don't pay my paycheck. How dare you? That's truly what he did. Wow. And this wow. very timid person. So she calls me up and she tells me and I go, are you still shaking? And she goes, yeah. And I go, okay. So remember, you're only responsible for your own yard. So we have this saying, you only mind your own yard. I said, how did you do in your own yard? Because your own yard was to go and do this frustration tool from a place of your intention and your respect for both yourself and for him. So mm -hmm. how did you do? She goes, well, honestly, when I just think about that, I'm very proud of myself. And I said, heck yeah. I said, don't go into his yard. It's none of your business what he's doing in his yard. So you can focus there and discourage yourself or you can focus here that you did something that felt really important for you to do. And so about six months later, she calls me and she says, you know what, he's never done that to me again. And not only that, he's coming around here going, now what is this stuff you guys are doing over here? And, <laughs> and she kind of plays it down, you know, she's like, oh, we're just doing this life work stuff. And he'll say, well, I've got a lot of gossip over in my area. And she'll say, well, yeah, we used to have a lot of that too. Or I have people that are really being ugly and, and uh, you know, uh, irresponsible. And she's like, yeah, we used to have a lot of that too. And um, because she just doesn't want to, you know, try to convince him or anything. She just wanted him to know part of the reason he was doing that, because he not only came to her, he came to her boss and said, what is this stuff you guys are doing over here? Because people were leaving his department and going over to this department and like, huh. oh, my God, this is like night and day over here. And I wow. think he was picking up on that. And yeah. even though the day that she did this, he was not happy with her for how dare she treat him like she deserves equal respect, you know, and, and do it in such right. a way I can't fire her, but, you know, um, <laughs> but on some level it worked because she even told me he'd never done it to her again. And, wow. you know, you never know that a person will change their behavior. You still feel different when you've changed yours, Absolutely. even if that other person doesn't change. But in this case, she actually did change. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great story. And I think it speaks to maybe even, even though it's tough and sometimes the moment doesn't always turn out the way that we want it. Sometimes we still have those impacts and, and, and maybe because we take responsibility of, of our own, of our own mm -hmm. actions and what mm -hmm. we can do to actually, I mean, be the change, right? Not to be, be cliche with it. No, it's but, so true. But it's true. It's yeah. Very true. Yeah. And you know, even if I hadn't been the person that she came back and reported to, that's what their mentors are in the workplace. So yeah. a big part of what we do is ongoing mentoring is provided to everybody. So when you have a situation like that and you can come back and a mentor could say what I said, yeah. Hey, how did you do in your yard? Yeah. You know, that that's a way that everybody helps each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so with the, the systems that, that we currently have in place are, are we're, we're talking about systematic change 
mm-hmm. you know, within our organizations, within our communities. And w- the systems currently really breed a lot of, uh, a lot of that, that power differential. Um, yes. I mean, just in terms of how we're raised, mm-hmm. um, what we're taught, depending on, on our family mm-hmm. about, you know, who's better than the other person and in yes. and, and, and money and, or, or maybe it's a race thing. And, and I know sometimes, you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a, it's a sad thing to hear, but it is a reality that in certain uh, uh, groups, they, they do have to, you know, they, they, they feel like they, they not, I shouldn't say they have to, but they feel like they have to like warn their kids even about the, the disparities and whatnot. So mm-hmm. that, that learning of those disparities, you know, can it continue um, in, in the differences and, and what are some steps that, that we can take? as individuals today to try to be that change, to try to help start moving forward this idea of the systematic change and, and kind of getting from a place of the power differentials and, and getting to a place where we, we uh, take responsibility for our own yard mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and at least try to make our, our yard and what we can control and what we can do to be the, the, the best representation of, of love and unity uh, that it can be? You know, there are so many ways, you know, that are important, but I would say that my most important starting place with people is to first know and understand what they don't know that they don't know. So when you even talk yeah. about this happening in homes, I could give you 30 examples or more of ways that we uh, uh, misuse and abuse power with children, even in the normalist yeah. families, right? And yeah. Some of them are, are way worse. Um, and so part of it is that we have to be willing to look at our belief systems and consider that they're outdated and that there's something better. So mm-hmm. we call that spitting in the soup of those sacred cows. Mm-hmm. Those sacred cows, people get defensive about it. Well, I was spanked and it didn't hurt me any, you know, and we don't realize that those are the seeds of callousness. Those are the seeds of believing that's the only way to solve a problem or to change behavior. I'm just using that as a really rough example. Yeah. But what, what we do before we do any tool uh, application with people is we help them to start dismantling and really being so disgusted with the soup of those control models. We call it spitting in the soup. Because once you are really willing to say, okay, that is not a good thing to keep picking back up, now you're really ready to create a completely different system. But what mm-hmm. we do instead is we put tools on top of that control system, and then we wonder why they don't work. I mean, mm-hmm. you remember, I'll just tell you the tiny part again, because I know you've heard this, of the uh, eighth grade student who came in and said, I'm being bullied by a teacher because uh, we adopted a new tool called the Peace Pledge, where we're supposed to put our hands on our hearts and say, I pledge to use my words and actions for peace. Only the right. homeroom teacher said, if you don't do it, you're going to get a detention. You know, I mean, that's mm. really craziness, right? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. teach you how to be peaceful by hitting you overhead with a hammer and right. threatening you. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you know, that's why we really work on um, put down the control models and then you will learn these tools in a way that will really be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So there's just a lot to it, but it first and foremost is mindset change. Yeah, I, I think what you say or what you're saying about you don't know what you don't know is is extremely impactful. If you mm-hmm. take a second and, and apply it to introspection and say, you know what, there might be some things that you don't even realize about yourself and your own biases that might be affecting how you're coming across. I know I've had many, many moments in my life where I, I had to take a step back and go, you know what? That I mm, I don't think that that was received the way that it was intended to be, or you know maybe maybe I I was you know caught up in a in a you know frustrated moment or something like that, and and maybe it was not uh, sent the way that really I I, I wanted to you know to mm-hmm, send that mm-hmm. message you know so well you know I don't think um, I don't think most of like I've done this work for years and I'm always still learning right. so it, it it really is about. Um, being willing to question your beliefs even at all. Like what, what's really interesting is one of my favorite quotes is on change blindness. And it was by Samuel Arbusman. And he said, we have a problem with change blindness. It's kind of twofold. He goes, it's not that we're not even getting exposed to things. Sometimes we're really getting exposed to new systems and things, but we yeah. don't want to go out of our way to have to change. Yeah. And, and then the other part of it that I think is even more important is that We don't want to consider that our ideas are outdated. And I think it's almost as if we are so identified with our ideas that we feel like we're going to lose ourselves if we consider upgrading them. 
Like yeah. you and I, none of us would be uncomfortable or afraid to upgrade a phone generally. You know, I mean, once in a while, there are people that still have a flip phone, right? Well, but most of us, yeah. <laughs> we look forward to the upgrade because it usually has something way better about it, right? And we're not ashamed of the old phone. We're just excited for the new phone. But when it comes to emotional intelligence and human behavior, people act as if that's my sacred cow. It should never change. I've been the right. Yeah. I've been in the right. If I admit that it's outdated, then it makes me irrelevant. And that's right. just crazy thinking right there. Yeah. Um, well, so. I, I can understand it though. Yeah. Yes, we, we're we're really taught that beliefs often don't don't change, and that you should be rooted in in your beliefs. And mm -hmm. and a lot of people are are scared to to take the the time or 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 take the risk of challenging those beliefs of understanding why you believe that way, and even saying, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a better way out there. And yeah, well, it is our, our biggest um, enemy is our, our pain threshold. Like when yeah. you really think about it, we've got 71% yeah. disengagement before we even had a pandemic. So how tolerant we are of how crappy it is, right, <laughs> you know, right. like That's we really, somebody, somebody said something one time about substituting crappy with, I don't forget the other word, but we are, we're so conditioned to accept things in a, in a less than an ideal or, excellent way and yeah. it's you know once we have the good we don't want to go back to the ways that we have absolutely absolutely well i think it i think it's definitely time that uh well it's maybe even timely i should say that people are really starting to to question that but you know i encourage everybody on all sides to to try to to look at their own biases and just encourage everybody to take a second to look at their own yard. You know, I'm, I'm looking at that every day and I'm, and I'm always trying to better understand how to support everybody and uh, as much as I can, you know, and not I, saying I that I'm perfect say, at it by any means. As much as you, I think that's a good idea to look at our own yards. I don't even know that we can look at our own yards uh, without, without kindness, unless we yeah. make this uh, an initial question, what system would help me manage my yard better? Um, yeah. because it's really, we're, we're so bad about either blaming others or blaming ourselves where what we really should be doing yeah. is going, I wonder what system would help fix this, you know? Yeah. Um, that's a much more holistic and moving in the, you know, encouragement. Right. Uh, and yes, and I'm going to make my yard priority, but I want to know how to do that yard better because that's yeah. also, you know. Important. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah. Even asking like, what kind of yard do you want to have really? Right. And and what kind of yard do I have right now? I have to take a step back and look at it. You know, sometimes it's hard to right. see that the the forest through the trees, if they as they say, it's sometimes it's really hard to take that step back. But you know, ask people yeah. around you. Like it, it, you know, if 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 I'm if I'm preaching more unity and love, am I am I showing it? Am I displaying it? Or my actions driving that forward? You know, it's well and I also think what's gonna help larger and bigger amounts of people change is to see more and more success stories. You know, yeah, like we, um, we saw an Adlerian approach used in a prison system in Florida and the normal amount of repeat reincarceration, which is called recidivism is mm -hmm. ironically about the same number that we have for our disengagement in workplace. It's around 70%. Yeah. And in a prison where they used this mindset and this set of tools, the recidivism went down to 4%. And that's what we're seeing similar kind of outstanding results in our workplaces that we're working in. But it, until it, there's enough of us seeing those, like just like that, that executive was like, what are you guys doing over here? Right. Until people realize it really can be different. They're going to sit back and go, Oh, it's as good as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. And, and did I hear you right? You say that it, the, the recidivism. So people going back to prison went from 70% down, down to 4%. 4%. And we even have wow. a paper on it because my daughter wrote a paper about it in college because wow. she and I were both going through Adlerian, Adlerian training programs wow. at the time. Yeah, that's pretty outstanding. And part of it is yeah. that, I mean, even when you think about it, like think about a person who we would never think of relating to. Like, let's say mm -hmm. there's a gang member and part of being in a gang means they have to go and shoot somebody as their initiate, you know, the initiation. Right, right. And maybe the only place that they ever believed they could feel empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing was in that gang. And, and yeah. they believe that was the only place they'll override their conscience and fear of imprisonment to get those needs met. Absolutely. Those are the exact same needs you and I have. We just have a bigger idea of how we could get those met. 
Right. So we really right. take that desperate, desperate path, but we're really no different than they are. And that's hard for well, people. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people, I mean, a lot of people get in that most, I would say probably most people who are in that situation feel like that's their only path and then right. they don't, and, and they don't have any other options. Well, and, and then, you know, and then they're treated like monsters and then they believe they're monsters right. and then they will continue to act like a monster because yeah. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But when, Absolutely. when those people went in and, and worked with them, they, they said, look, take yourself out of the monster box. We're not going to put you in the monster box. That's, that's you wonderful. are no different than I am. Let's look at how you can get these needs, needs met a different way. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time uh, here on the show today. We'll have to, we'll have to circle back around and, and dig into this even more. Um, yeah. You know, this is, I think, something that's really relevant to pretty much everybody. Everybody's experienced this. Everybody's dealt with it to some degree, certainly some far more than others. So, um, yeah, so, absolutely right. Yeah. So, so I, again, I really appreciate it. And um, I, yes, it's, it's time for success. We, we partner with Judy and, and with the LifeWorks systems. But if anybody's got any specific questions, um, that they want to reach out to you and ask you, what, what's a good way to reach out to you? Well, I would encourage people to go to our website. We've got tons of information okay. and videos yeah. and webinars. And, you know, I have over 180 published articles. We have industry articles in our article section that are written by yeah. Forbes and Inc. and all of that. But also they can uh, find our phone number, our email address, all that. So it's life okay. work systems. Life and work are singular. Systems is plural. Dot com. And so right. that's the, that's my email address. If somebody wants to write Judy at LifeWork Systems or go <laughs> into our website, you know, I would love to talk to people that are listening to this. Mm -hmm. You cannot over communicate with me. So don't hold back. <laughs> um, just a regular person that loves what I do. And I'd be really delighted to talk with anybody. Awesome. Thank you so much. And again, this is your host, Matt Barbie. And if you really want a business where you love going into work every day and you want your people to feel like they love going into work every day and you have the life that you want, plus you're empowering your people to have the lives that you want. I mean, if all that sounds awesome, please reach out to us. 314-441-5423. Thank you, Matt.